Hi everyone, this lesson is on an often unrecognized and unknown tick-borne infection known as anaplasmosis. So we're going to talk about this condition, how individuals get infected by it, also talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed, and how it's treated. So anaplasmosis is a zoonotic infection caused by infection with anaplasma species. So zoonotic infection is an infection from animals, and as we'll see, it's going to be a tick-borne infection. And anaplasma species are gram-negative bacteria, and the species most specifically that's going to often lead to infection is known as anaplasma phagocytophyllum. And these types of bacteria are obligate intracellular parasites. So obligate meaning that they have to live this lifestyle. Intracellular means it's inside the cell. So they're a parasite that have to live inside the cell. Now if you look at this image here, you can see a conglomerate of anaplasma organisms inside a granulocyte. We'll discuss this a bit more later. And as I mentioned before, it is a tick-borne illness. So it is transmitted via tick bites. Although we have seen rare cases of a transmission via blood transfusion. So if one person has anaplasmosis and they give blood, the person receiving their blood could also be infected by anaplasmosis as well, although that's a rare way that this is transmitted. And the particular tick that carries this particular bacteria is known as the Ixodes tick or the black legged tick or the deer tick. So it has multiple names. Ixodes tick or this deer tick also carries other types of bacteria that cause well-known illnesses like Lyme disease. It can also carry bacteria that cause babesiosis as well. So this particular tick can harbor multiple types of infective organisms. So they might harbor one, they might harbor multiple, but they can lead to different infections. Again, anaplasmosis is one of them, Lyme disease, we can also see babesiosis and some other ones as well. And we'll discuss this a bit later on, but the main animal reservoir for anaplasma bacteria is the white-footed mouse. We can also see it with white-tailed deer as well. Now, these infections occur globally. In the United States, it's mostly reported in the upper Midwest and the Northeast, so mostly the Northeastern United States. It has also been reported in Northern Europe and also in Southeast Asia. And what is interesting about this particular infection is that when there have been global studies looking at serology, so serology is looking at blood work to see if there's any antibodies against this particular bacteria, we actually do find certain populations around the world with relatively high levels of antibodies against this particular bacteria. So for instance, in one study, it was found that in Northwest Wisconsin, in the United States, 15% of the population had antibodies against anaplasma species. And other studies have also shown that 17% of Slovenians have antibodies against this particular bacteria. So oftentimes this may be more common than we actually recognize. And that's going to mean that a lot of times infections are going to be subclinical. We'll discuss this later when we discuss the signs and symptoms. And what we do find when we look at particular patients who get infected by this bacteria, it can occur in all age groups, but we often see it more likely occurring in males over the age of 40. And when we look at male to female ratios, males slightly outnumber females 1.4 to 1. So males are on average slightly more likely to get infected by anaplasma. Now let's discuss how an individual gets infected by anaplasmosis. So it all starts off with eggs of a tick. So when those ticks develop, they are nymphs and then they can develop into adult ticks, they're going to be non-infected ticks. So they don't start out with the bacteria in their system until they bite an infected animal. Now, as I mentioned before, one of the most common animal reservoirs is the white-footed mouse. The other name for the white-footed mouse is Paromyscus leucopus. So if a non-infected tick bites a white-footed mouse that is infected with anaplasma bacteria, the ticks can then carry or harbor that bacteria. So once the tick has bit that white-footed mouse, or could be other animals like the white-tailed deer, as mentioned before, they are infected ticks. So they are carrying the anaplasma bacteria around. Now the problem is that when humans come into contact, if they're walking outside in long grass, or if they're walking through wooded areas and there's a tick that ends up latching on to the human host, they can transmit the bacteria into the human host. That can lead to this particular infection. And is often the case is that if you get bit by a tick and you remove the tick pretty quickly, the bacteria may not have been transmitted to you. But if the tick has 
latched on and has stayed latched on for at least 24 hours, then that gives enough time for transmission of the bacteria. So oftentimes it's going to be where there's a latched on tick for longer period of time than you might expect for the transmission of the bacteria into the human host. But in other cases, it may be a quicker transmission. So again, it's often going to take a little bit more time than you might expect for transmission of the bacteria. So what we will see is that when a tick is biting, if it has had enough time latched on, the anaplasma bacteria can start to be transmitted into the patient's tissues. Now, once the anaplasma bacteria enter into the tissues, they can enter into the bloodstream, go through the bloodstream, and invade and infect the bone marrow and the spleen. Then after they've infected the bone marrow and the spleen, they can infect granulocytes. So they can infect granulocytes, they can reside in the granulocyte in cytoplasmic vacuoles, and they can do multiple effects on the granulocyte, like a neutrophil, in that it can lead to granulocyte dysfunction, so some of the cells may not function properly. It can also end up leading to the release of interleukin-10, interleukin-12, and interferon gamma, which then contribute to tissue injury as well. So there's multiple effects that happen once those anaplasma bacteria enter into the granulocytes. And we'll discuss some of those when we talk about the signs and symptoms. And overall, from when the bacteria get transmitted from the tick bite, all the way until symptoms start to occur, that's roughly one to two weeks. So that is the incubation period. So the incubation period is one to two weeks. Now briefly, because we talked about the fact that the anaplasma bacteria reside in granulocytes and not agranulocytes, let's discuss what granulocytes are. So granulocytes are going to be immune cells or white blood cells that contain granules, whereas agranulocytes do not contain granules. So what types of immune cells actually fall under these categories? So granulocytes include neutrophils, which are white blood cells that deal with bacterial infections. There are basophils and eosinophils, which both have different roles in dealing with parasitic infections. And then in the category of agranulocytes, we have lymphocytes, which are part of the acquired immune system, and monocytes. So monocytes can be formed into macrophages when they go into tissue. So those are the different types of immune cells. So again, anaplasma affects granulocytes. Now, as I mentioned before, after a tick has bitten a patient, the bacteria gets transmitted into the patient. There is a incubation period of one to two weeks. And what will happen is that we can see a particular spectrum of signs and symptoms of this condition. So we can either have mild signs and symptoms all the way up to severe and life-threatening signs and symptoms. We'll discuss all of these here in a moment. What we do find is that in the mild cases, that occurs in majority of immunocompetent individuals. Immunocompetent means that the patients have a healthy, functional immune system. And with regards to the cases that are more severe and life-threatening, these include older patients, immunosuppressed patients, and anybody that has delayed treatment. So what we can see is in older patients, they can have poor immune functioning. Immunosuppressed, this could be individuals who have AIDS or have diabetes or are on some immunosuppressive treatment. And then delayed treatment. Sometimes we may see some cases that are symptomatic where we have mild cases that over time they're not dealt with that can become more and more severe. So that could also occur in some cases. But as I mentioned before, there is some evidence suggesting that a lot of patients don't even have symptoms. They are what we would call subclinical or asymptomatic. In the case where there are symptoms, we'll talk about the mild cases here first. So oftentimes, even if a patient does end up getting severe symptoms, they're going to start with mild symptoms. And the mild symptoms are going to occur early on in disease, and they're going to often occur in the first one to five days of symptoms. So what we can see is fever and chills, malaise, or just feeling generally unwell, kind of sort of tired, fatigued, worn out. Headaches can also be another finding, myalgias or muscle aches and pains. This is often going to be diffuse, so your entire body just feels achy and sore and tender. Nausea and vomiting can also occur in some patients, although this is going to be less common than the other findings. Diarrhea is also another finding. Stiff neck, we can see stiff neck in some cases, and a rash could also occur in particular cases. So on average, a rash can occur in 10% of patients or less that have symptoms. And if there is a case where 
that particular Ixodes tick was carrying multiple infective organisms, like not only Anaplasma bacteria, but they could also be harboring Borrelia burgdorferi bacteria that cause Lyme disease. We may see other types of rashes like erythema migrans rash, which is characteristic of Lyme disease. That is also something that could also occur as well. Now, with regards to severe symptoms, severe symptoms, again, can occur in older patients, in patients who are immunocompromised. And again, it's often going to be with regards to later in the disease progression. So even some of those immunocompromised patients may start off with some of the mild symptoms, and then they can have their symptoms worsen over time. And what we do see is that roughly one third of patients who do have symptoms may require hospitalization due to the severity of symptoms. And three to 7% of patients who have symptoms can have life-threatening complications. So let's talk about some of those issues here. So some of those can include respiratory issues, so difficulty breathing. We can also see rhabdomyolysis, which is a breakdown or destruction of muscle. So muscles that are broke down can release what we call myoglobin. Myoglobin is the hemoglobin equivalent in the muscle, but it's not supposed to be outside of the muscle. So if myoglobin gets released into the blood, it can damage the kidneys. There can be kidney injury, so that can also cause issues. And if it's not dealt with, there can be kidney failure. Septic shock can also occur as well. This can lead to hypotension or a low blood pressure. There can be altered mental status as well. And then we can ultimately see multi-organ failure in some cases. As mentioned before, many people that get infected by anaplasmosis likely have very few or vague symptoms and they would be considered subclinical. They don't even present themselves to healthcare providers. So we don't see a lot of evidence of this tick infection being brought to healthcare providers' attention. So a lot of times, most patients may not even know they've been infected by this. But in the cases where we do see signs and symptoms, there can be some of these severe symptoms, as mentioned before. And in 1% of the cases where there are symptoms, this could be lethal. And this is going to come from septic shock and multi-organ failure, again, most of the time in those who are immunosuppressed or immunocompromised. Now, some other severe symptoms of anaplasmosis include effects on the nerves. These include cranial nerve palsies. We can have demyelinating polyneuropathy occurring. We can also have bilateral facial nerve palsy. So both sides of the face becoming paralyzed. And in those particular cases, patients may recover, but some of the nerve function may take several months to recover. And then in approximately 1% of cases, there could be meningoencephalitis. So meningitis plus encephalitis. So we'd have fever, headache, stiff neck, and altered mental status. Now let's discuss how this condition is diagnosed and treated by clinicians. So oftentimes, if you were to take blood work from a patient, they're going to have leukopenia, which is a low leukocyte count or low white blood cell count. They can have thrombocytopenia, which is a low platelet count. Then they can also have elevated liver transaminases. And elevated liver transaminases occur in roughly 70% of patients with anaplasmosis. We can also see elevated creatinine, elevated lactate dehydrogenase, and elevated amylase. Some of these can be due to some of the more severe effects that this infection can have. So elevated creatinine can indicate poor kidney functioning, and elevated lactate dehydrogenase can be a sign of poor blood perfusion, so that can be finding in shock patients. So all of these can occur in more severe cases. If we were to do a blood culture and we were to look at a blood smear, we can see in granulocytes, intracytoplasmic aggregates of anaplasma. So again, if we look at that same image that we looked at before, we can see the aggregates of anaplasma residing in granulocytes. And I do want to mention here, because this can be an important test point, in anaplasmosis, granulocytes are going to be affected. So that's where we're going to see intracytoplasmic aggregates in granulocytes in anaplasmosis. But there is another tick infection known as ehrlichiosis, which the bacteria do a similar thing where they reside intracellularly. But in the case of ehrlichiosis, they reside in monocytes. And again, monocytes are agranulocytes. So that's going to be the difference here. And a way to remember this is by the mnemonic MEGA. So M-E, monocytes ehrlichiosis, G-A, granulocytes anaplasmosis. So this is just an important test point for those who are studying for exams. And these intracytoplasmic aggregates are found in granulocytes in 20 to 80% of anaplasmosis cases. So not all, but about 20 to 80% of cases. Now, we can also do serology testing. We can see if there's antibodies against anaplasmosis, although this could 
simply indicate a past infection. We can also do PCR to check for the genetics of anaplasma. So those are some of the ways that this can be diagnosed. Now, how do clinicians treat anaplasmosis? So the treatment is going to be doxycycline. So doxycycline is going to be given at 100 milligrams PO or by mouth BID or twice a day for 14 to 21 days. Now, oftentimes we'll start to see clinical improvement after three to four days. If we don't, it's important to assess for other tick-borne illnesses like Babesia infections, as this will require a different treatment. So that's important to point out here because, as mentioned before, Ixodes tick could be carrying not only anaplasma bacteria, they could also be carrying Borrelia burgdorferi, which causes Lyme disease, or they could be carrying Babesia species that cause Babesiosis. So the length of treatment of doxycycline is often going to be 14 to 21 days, or it can be at least three days after defervescence. So defervescence is going to be where the patient stops having a fever. So after they've started to clinically improve with treatment, the treatment should continue at least three days after that. So if you've been treating the patient for 14 or 15 days, they have defervescence, you want to do that at least another three days. Now doxycycline is going to be the main treatment for anaplasmosis, but in certain cases, for instance, in young children, especially under the age of seven or eight, and in pregnant patients, we often try to avoid tetracyclines because of their effects on bone. So we often may need to use other types of antibiotics. These include rifampin and amoxicillin. If you want to learn more about Lyme disease and babesiosis, please check out my lessons on those topics. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.